Eve show here and I'm delighted to be joining you tonight for our third in our climate speaker series, New Approaches to Climate Change. Um, this is um, this is a talk that I'm particularly interested in because it's about using space for us to better understand climate change and Earth observation more specifically. Now, um, tonight we're going to be hearing from Dr. Anna Maria Trofer and she works at the European Space Agency's Climate Office and she is what's known as a cryosphere scientist and she looks particularly at the arctic region so that's in the in the north pole regions to see how much sea ice and glaciers and um, and snow have retreated over the years and by looking at data for a long periods of time we are able to predict um just how much climate change is impacting us on the ground it's got a really great visual talk to give so i'm, I'm very excited for her to um share her talk shortly which will premiere at uh, five past seven um we tried a, a number of things for her to join us live tonight but look at this is the world we live in with the wi-fi and the broadband and uh where she is at the moment in the uk just the wi-fi just isn't strong enough and when you see her visual her presentation is you'll understand why she used lots of great slides and animations and everything so i hope that that um will make the difference but what, what i'm going to do is um so her talk is just under 20 minutes long so around about 25 past seven i'll come back live and um i'll take while you're watching the talk i'll keep an eye on the comments that are coming in and um, i'll do a little roundup on that and as i say this is a series of talks um as part of the Abbey Leaks Climate Action Project, I'm the science communicator in residence. And the idea of these talks is for us to kind of um, find extra information that we aren't already familiar with within the community. And certainly, um, I don't believe that um, the Abbey Leaks uh, community have been uh, that up to speed on what's happening in the space sector. So Earth observation is a term used to describe um, satellites that orbit earth to look down on earth and there are special sensors on board that detect um they can detect different gas levels or water levels or they have all different um they have all different objectives and so by looking down on earth we can use that data to monitor how our climate's faring and how we can predict going forward so that's the sector that Anna Maria is involved in, uh, manipulating and um, monitoring data that comes, that is all available for all of us actually, um, on the um, the European wide group of satellites that are observing our planet. And I'm going to go off now because just in case it might take a minute or two. So, so just stay on this page and you'll see in a second, um, her talk is going to premiere at five minutes past seven and then I'll come back on and uh, we'll finish it off from there. And we have one more talk to go next Wednesday as part of these new approaches to climate change speaker series. Okay, I'm off. Hope you enjoy the talk. Hello. My name is Anne-Marie Trofaya, and I'm a cryosphere scientist with the European Space Agency's Climate Office. My background is in satellite remote sensing of the polar landscape, in particular of snow and ice. Today, I would like to talk to you about monitoring our planet, its climate and the cryosphere from space, with a particular focus on the high Arctic. So this talk really stems from some of the work we are doing within the Climate Office, but also within the European Space Agency's Directorate of Earth Observation, of which the Climate Office is only a small element. So let's talk about observing climate change from space, Arctic research in the age of satellites. The Climate Office is primarily in charge of running the Climate Change Initiative programme, the main objective of which is to help characterise the Earth's climate and its change by creating long, consistent, error-characterised climate data records using the entire satellite archive. As you are all aware, there's a well-known quote, climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. So while you would expect it to be mild and wet in the UK, where I am at the moment, there will be days you get up, look out the window and realise it's a lovely sunny day. 
At the Climate Office, we try to record climate. But what is a climate data record, you might ask? Well, we define climate data records to be a time series of measurements of certain variables that are crucial to characterising our planet's climate. So in the case of the UK, you know it's wet and mild because we have long records of temperature and precipitation. But there are many other variables that we can measure that characterise our planet's climate, such as, for instance, Arctic sea ice extent and its thickness. To get a useful measurement, a climate data record needs to be of sufficient length, consistency and continuity so that we can determine climate variability and change. Climate data records can be created by merging data from surface, atmosphere and space-based systems. So what does this mean? To understand why we're doing this, let me take a step back and start with a brief history of international cooperation to monitor the climate. International Cooperation for Climate probably started in the 1980s, when the depletion of the ozone layer due to chlorofluorocarbons was a major concern. In 1987, all 197 UN member states adopted the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer. The ozone layer, of course, acts as a shield that reduces the amount of UV radiation that we receive at ground level. And in the mid-1980s, a large hole appeared in the ozone layer above Antarctica. From space, we have the vantage point that lets us monitor variables such as atmospheric ozone. These observations provide the evidence for policymakers to take action and the recovery of the ozone hole perfectly illustrates how Earth observation data and scientific evidence can lead to clear political action. The Montreal Protocol to this day remains one of the huge successes, a testament to what can actually be achieved when all nations pull together to work for a bright future. International cooperation on climate did not stop there. In 1988, the UN Environment Programme, together with the World Meteorological Organization, established the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is arguably the most important scientific assessment of human-made climate change. It was meant to prepare a comprehensive review with recommendations on the state of the art of the science of climate change and the IPCC reports are indeed to this day the scientific foundations on which all international negotiations are built. In the early 1990s, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed. The UNFCCC is the legal framework for negotiating international treaties to reduce carbon emissions. But policy needs to be based on science and the convention needed a scientific voice. This is also when the Global Climate Observing System was found. Its task was to identify the variables that need to be observed systematically to be able to characterise the Earth's climate and monitor its change. This is where the idea of essential climate variables and climate data records stems from. But it was only at the climate conference in Bali in 2007 that it became apparent that the space agencies were way behind the curve in terms of supporting climate science from satellite observations. What was needed were long-term, multi-mission, consistent, unbiased data sets of essential climate variables with relevant uncertainty measurements. The European Space Agency then set an activity in motion that would change the way we dealt with thematic data products and arrive at these climate data records. And this is the ESA Climate Change Initiative Programme. If you want to know more about this programme, do visit our website. As I'm a cryosphere scientist, let me give you an example of the polar climate data records we have created and some research results from my cryosphere projects. You will all be aware that Arctic sea ice has been decreasing. 
Now you will notice in the animation here that the ice has a seasonal cycle. It grows in the winter and it decreases in the summer. You can also see this in this graph, but the important part, as for every climate data record, is to look at the trend in these data sets, which tells you the story of sea ice retreat. So this graph is derived from satellite information. We have had passive micro satellites in space since the 1970s, which allow us to measure sea ice extent in the Arctic Ocean. But we don't just look at the extent of Arctic sea ice. We also need to measure its thickness because sea ice is not just a two dimensional cover. It has volume. To understand how much sea ice there is, it is important to consider its thickness across the Arctic Ocean. And a different type of satellite system, such as the European Space Agency's Cryosat radar altimeter, can provide us with the appropriate information. Cryosat 2 has been in orbit for more than 10 years now. We are still planning its anniversary conference, which unfortunately was delayed last year due to COVID. And while 10 years is pretty good going for a satellite, the time series is rather short for a climate data record. Now we have had other radar altimeters in space and we use all of these data to create a consistent climate data record. Still, the climate data record for sea ice thickness is shorter than for sea ice extent. And these radar altimeters were put in space in the 1990s, but that is still sufficient information to tell us that not only the sea ice is retreating, it is also thinning. There is, of course, a lot of research going on related to how the climate signals interact with water, snow and ice. And the European Space Agency recently funded some experiments on the Mosaic expedition, which was a large international expedition where the German icebreaker Polarstern drifted with the pack ice over the course of 2020. And if you want to hear more about measuring sea ice thickness from space, do check out this recording I made a couple of years ago. It's available on SoundCloud, but you can also find it via the Twitter accounts. And we also talk about mosaic. I would like to stay in the high Arctic and zoom in on a place I used to call home once, Svalbard a frozen archipelago situated due north of mainland Norway in the Arctic Ocean, between 74 and 81 degrees north. The main island is called Spitsbergen, which is also where I was based, in the town of Longyearbyen. And indeed, it is where my heart remains, up north in the ice, because I'm all about adventure and science and where best to experience both than living in the frozen Arctic. Now, Svalbard is truly a land of ice and snow. 60% of it is covered by glaciers. One of my teams is actually doing a lot of work on monitoring glaciers in Svalbard because these glaciers are behaving really interestingly and more on that in a bit. But first, let me tell you about glaciers. So glaciers are these bodies of ice that over hundreds of years during cold periods have accumulated snow that then compacts down to gigatons of ice. In general, when more snow falls in the winter than melts in the summer, the glacier gradually builds up. So when we talk about glacier retreat, more ice is lost than is gained. That can be due to changing precipitation patterns and surface meltwater runoff, but in Svalbard, ice dynamics also play an important role. What do I mean by ice dynamics? Well, a glacier is not a solid per se. It is what we call a plastic solid. It will flow under force without breaking. The glacier sits at the top of a mountain valley and moves downhill under its own mass. How the ice moves over time is known as ice dynamics. In Svalbard, 60% of the glaciers are marine terminating. We call these tidewater glaciers. So they flow into the Arctic Ocean. And as they do this, they also lose ice to the ocean. This is known as carving. Ocean ice 
atmosphere interactions are a really important and interesting research field. Because as the climate system is changing, effects such as reduced sea ice lead to warmer oceans. And then the inflow of warm waters into fjords affects the carving rates of the tidewater glaciers. So the amount of ice moving downhill is related to the amount of ice lost through carving into the ocean. And therefore, a number of tidewater glaciers in the Arctic contribute to sea level rise, just like the large ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica themselves, which are a topic for another talk, perhaps. Basically, we're talking about ice lost from the land to the sea. Now, we can monitor glaciers by using optical or multispectral, as we call it, images from the Copernicus Sentinel-2 satellite, from which we can derive the glacier outlines. But we can also use another form of satellite radar technology, known as synthetic aperture radar, to calculate ice velocities. And this is what we have done up in Svalbard using the Copernicus Sentinel-1 satellite which is a synthetic aperture radar satellite. The great thing about radar is you can also do it during polar night. So you can monitor these glaciers throughout the year. And by looking at the time series of the glaciers, we can monitor how the flow velocity, how the flow velocity fields are changing over time. So we can monitor the behavior. Here's an example from Svalbard. This is Trangbrin. You can probably see in this Copernicus Sentinel-2 image, which is monochrome for contrast purposes, you can probably see this glacier is crevassed right to the top, to the highest point. And that's because it's in full surge mode. Glacier surging is a type of instability where the glacier starts to accelerate steadily over several years, which is then followed by a few months of very rapid acceleration with peak velocities up to 14 meters per day or so. Finally, the glacier then gradually ends this fast flow phase. The underlying processes are still very much an open research field. And in fact, this is one of the reasons the Glacier CCI, so Climate Change Initiative Project on Glaciers, is looking at the high Arctic islands. So you see in this animation a time series from Sentinel-1 data of Strongbrain, which is used to track how the velocity is evolving over time. And my team have done this for several glaciers in the high Arctic here. You see the Canadian North and Novaya Zemlya and Franz Josef Land, but also, of course, Svalbard on the bottom left. Of particular interest is the Ostfauna ice cap in the northeast of Svalbard, where we can see these surging glaciers that have very high flow velocities. If you're keen on learning more about how we use satellites to monitor the Earth's cryosphere, the European Space Agency is actually currently developing a massive open online course, which will hopefully become available soon in the spring. So watch this space. As for my team and I, we will continue to work on monitoring glacier behavior because we really want to get to the bottom of what exactly is going on up there in the high Arctic. We don't yet understand the mechanisms and feedbacks, and it isn't easy to link this to any climate forcing. But one thing is for certain, we're seeing a lot of glacier instabilities, which may be dominating the carving flux from Arctic ice caps and glaciers. And this carving flux is then linked to the sea level impact from this region. If we can better understand glacier behaviour and the underlying controls of glacier carving, we also better understand the contribution of the Arctic glaciers and ice caps to global sea level rise. And this is where reliable observations, in particular those from satellites, make the difference for improving our understanding of our planet and enabling us to assess the impacts of climate change and how climate change is reshaping our planet. 
The truth is that around 680 million people live in low-lying coastal zones across the globe, and every centimetre of sea level rise puts 3 million of these people at risk of annual coastal flooding. And we already know that for some island nations in the Pacific Ocean, it has gone past the point of no return. They will become inhabitable no matter what happens with greenhouse gas emissions. And it's not just far-flung countries that are affected. The intensity and frequency of storm surges will become a serious problem across the globe. In the UK, there have already been reports that a small town in North Wales will have to be abandoned and the infrastructure decommissioned in the next 26 years, as it will no longer be viable to defend the town from rising sea levels. That is coastal towns and livelihoods disappearing right here in the UK. Now, bringing it back to Earth observation. To support climate change adaptation, we need good observations. We need good observations of our climate system. For instance, we need to be able to say something about the rate of sea level rise and we can only do this comprehensively by using satellite technologies. To understand our world, we need to observe it. And it is satellite information that will help guide us to a more equitable and sustainable future. So that's it from me today. I hope you enjoyed this talk. Follow me on Twitter or do follow the Climate Office on Twitter for interesting updates on how we monitor our planet and its climate from space. Thank you all and good night. There you go. Yeah, I think I'm live. I never know. I never know. So there you go. Um, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, you know, I think that um, something that Anna Maria was saying is something that we we are experiencing on the ground. So she's involved in using data from satellites that orbit Earth that are provided by the European Space Agency, and she's specifically looking at glaciers and she's looking at those polar regions but there are other people working at the climate office that are working in different in different parts of that so we have one question I'm here just in case you have any questions I will do my best I'm looking at them on my phone this is all new now looking at this and doing this at the same time but bear with me um yeah some nice comments from people who who are watching a great question from Jared about who owns the satellites well um, that's a very good question, Jared. Um, there are many satellites um, orbiting Earth at the moment. There's about 2,700 that are operational and there's other ones that are um, just orbiting Earth that, that have finished what their job was originally. But the the satellites that Anna Maria are partic is particularly talking about, they're the satellites that are um, run from the European Union as part of the Copernicus fleet of satellites. And within that, we have um, a series of satellites called Sentinel satellites. And you heard her talking about Sentinel-1. And Sentinel-1 is a satellite that used radar and it's and it's looking at that region over um, the North Pole. And she mentioned polar night. And just I was just trying to find things that, that, um, that people would probably be asking me is, oh, sorry, I'm looking at myself. Oh my God, I'm so weird. Shut, stop it. Um, uh, polar night means you know, there are times of the year that the North Pole is in total darkness in the same way in the Antarctic or in the South Pole. There are times of the year where the Antarctic is in total darkness and that's called polar night. So that's what she means. So the great thing about the Sentinel satellites is that you can actually observe um, what's going on um, at the North Pole during these dark polar night regions when, when because of radar, you don't need sunlight to monitor it. So that's a question. Thank you very much from Jared. I'm going to see if I can find where um, the other comments are. Um, it's kind of confusing, isn't it? When you have, when you go live and then you're kind of watching the stream. Um, I can't actually see if there's any other comments coming in yet. I apologize. Um, I normally have um, somebody <laughs> helping me with this. Um, 
but I think you have a good idea and I think that there's a lot in that talk and it's certainly very different from the different conversations that we've had of late about climate change we've looked at it from the from the ground up and this is us looking at from space down and it's something that I'm particularly um fascinated by how space can help us understand our planet better and see it and see it differently so tonight was a taster of some of the people that are involved in that and uh, Anna Maria is part of the climate office um, for the European Space Agency and they're based in Harwell in the UK but the whole earth observation uh, division of the European Space Agency is in Italy in Esrine and I want to thank the people there particularly uh, Chiara Forin for arranging um, and putting me in touch with Anna Maria so um, get in touch with me if you have any questions or comments from um, this talk tonight. We have one more left. Next week, we are going to be speaking uh, to two people live from Arizona. And I'm sure the, web, the, the Wi-Fi signal will be great. And they're going to be talking to us from Biosphere. We have Kai Stats and we have John Adams speaking to us from Biosphere 2. Biosphere 2 was an experiment conducted in the Arizona de desert where um, an attempt was made to recreate an ecosystem under a glass dome and where people actually went in and conducted an experiment for a number of years. And on site, Kai Stats, who's somebody that I know from the space sector, is now designing and building a Mars habitat on site to um, see what lessons can be learned um, in creating another sort of ecosystem as if we were on Mars. So we'll be hearing for the two of them next week at seven o'clock. And um, thank you very much for tuning in and watching us tonight. If you have any comments, please leave them. And if you have any questions for me, uh, please get back to me and I will uh, send them on to Anna Maria or I'll attempt to answer them myself. So um, have a good night and I will see you again here next Wednesday. <laughs>